So I'd like to introduce now our, um, our friend Ketan Chef, very distinguished lawyer, counsellor, lead governor at um, Central Northwest London Foundation Trust, who's going to chair the session this evening. And he's going to um, introduce our very distinguished panel as well. So welcome everyone and over to you, Ketan. Thank you, Juliet, for that uh, incredibly warm welcome. Uh, so friends, uh, good to see you all. Uh, good evening to uh, each of you. And uh, welcome to this community discussion about how food, food equality leads to health equality, which I am very pleased, as you just heard uh, Judith say, um, uh, co-hosting with my good friends at Healthwatch Brand and the Advocacy Project. So, uh, I am Ketan Sheth, um, a councillor here in Brent and chair of Community and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. I'm also the lead governor at Central and Northwest London NHS Foundation Trust, where I am one of the people who represent the public interest in the thinking around decisions it takes. The NHS is often said to be a misnomer as it's really a national illness service absolutely essential and does a great job for the sick and the injured. It was also a calculation back in 1948 that once the illness backlog was cleared over a decade or so, that NHS spending would reduce. But friends, there was a big surprise as the NHS dispensed 7.5 million pairs of glasses a year in its early days. This led to a political crisis and the beginnings of an understanding that there was more to health than founders thought. Clean drinking water and waste disposal historically are amongst the most significant contributions to longer and healthier lives. We also know how folic acid to flower and for pregnant people and fluoride for drinking water in some areas for better dental health. Laws on food quality and the work of the Food Standards Agency are taken for granted now, but the earliest English food laws included the size of bread and ale introduced in 2066 about the quality, weight and price of bread and beer a significant development about food quality and its price. Malnutrition still exists. We still read heartbreaking stories of abuse, sometimes poverty. You may recall the story from Blackpool of children eating paper at school. And more positively, the recent work of the great footballer, Marcus Rashford, addressing food insecurity at schools in holiday times. Another aspect of mal malnutrition is obesity, particularly childhood obesity, children's tooth decay and oral health, causing enormous damage to people's health. And with people from poorer background and some ethnic minorities where it is disproportionately higher. And again, we know this only too well how the pandemic has disproportionately impacted ethnic minorities. Clearly, there is a lot going on with food. And pandemic has really shown a light on health inequalities, which we have known about for a long time. And now the urgent need to do something about it. So friends, tonight we are looking at how all these things interact. Quality diet, price, living circumstances, anxiety, and more. I have got some great friends of mine to start off this important conversation. Of course, this is hugely important and complex discussion and the hour that we have won't be enough. But I'm very keen for us to start off this conversation and for my guest, this evening to highlight some of the good work they are doing and what more we all can do going forward. 
So friends, my first guest this uh, evening is my great friend, Dr. Landia Bosch, who is joining us all the way from uh, Washington, DC. Uh, Landia has a PhD from the University of Cambridge in health geography. I'm grateful to the work that he did for my childhood obesity report only a couple of years ago. He's the leading expert in the relationship between childhood obesity, childhood overweight uh, in primary school children and the energy expenditure as well as built public spaces. So Lenda, all the way from Washington DC, all the way from the World Bank, it is really good to see you. It'd be really good if you could spend um, the next five minutes or so highlighting for us uh, some of the key um, aspect um, that uh, you came across when you were doing your research paper, please. Fantastic, uh, Kajan. Thank you very much for, for the introduction and, uh, and good afternoon uh, from DC. Good evening to all of you uh, over there in the UK. Um, it's wonderful to see such a, a broad audience and, and a great set of panelists uh, to discuss the crucial role uh, that food plays in determining health outcomes. Uh, as Ketan said, I'm Lambert Bosch and I'm a geographer of health. And that means that my research focuses on studying the impact of the environment uh, in which we live on our health and well-being. I'm currently, as, as Ketan uh, uh, said, working for the development branch uh, of the World Bank Group uh, in Washington, DC. Um, but I recently completed my PhD uh, from the University of Cambridge with a study on the drivers of childhood overweight and obesity uh, in London. And that's what I'll be talking about um, today. Um, it's important to note that as a geographer, uh, I do not look at questions of health through a biomedical lens. Uh, I look at how surroundings, in this case, the built characteristics of the neighborhoods and the city which we live in, how they influence our behaviors and how those behaviors then result in poorer or better health outcomes. Uh, and for my PhD, I therefore did not look at the genetics of overweight and obesity, but at how the city, how London shapes our day-to-day -day life and what it is about certain environments in London that lead us to see more or less uh, childhood overweight and obesity. Uh, and childhood obesity particularly remains a major public health concern uh, in London as around the globe, um, although it's a largely preventable condition. Um, childhood obesity levels in London are high, um, as almost a quarter of year six uh, pupils is currently living with obesity. Um, and despite tremendous efforts, both from the science and the policy side, um, we've not been able to turn the tide on children's weight. Um, in the last 10 years, nearly all boroughs uh, have seen an increase in overweight and obesity among their child uh, and youth population. So in recent years, there has been increased attention to the role of the place where children live in determining their food consumption and physical activity, uh, influencing their body shapes. And that's what geographers of health study and the topic of my PhD research uh, in London. Uh, and I'd like to focus on one specific part uh, of that research, which was set in the neighborhoods of Newham and Brent, um, both boroughs with above average levels uh, of children living with obesity, with over 25% of children uh, confronted with that condition. Aside from a large scale statistical study uh, involving around 2000 primary school children in London, I wanted to zoom in on specific neighborhoods to figure out how the environment that kids live in determines their food consumption and physical activity with an impact on their body weight. And to the end, I invited a very diverse group of 60 children in years three, four, and five to participate uh, in a study uh, of their neighborhoods and their behaviors. And what we did um, was something called walk along interviews, whereby we interview, uh, whereby the interviews carried out while walking through the neighborhood and questions about the neighborhood and the effect on behavior arise in real life and real time. And that provides a unique insight into how children perceive their surroundings, how they act, and what factors in their surroundings actually drive healthy and unhealthy behaviors. Uh, and to complete that picture, children also wore an activity tracker for a week and recorded their behaviors uh, in a journal for seven days. And the results that came out of that study were quite concerning, as 90% of participating children did not meet minimum physical activity requirements, in particular girls, younger children, and those uh, who commute to school using cars. And what stood out was the impact of the environment on decisions related to both food consumption and physical activity. Especially the commute on the way home after school was concerning, as the children and their parents or caretakers 
were found to frequently stop at convenience stores or fast food shops, in particular chicken and chip shops, to purchase foodstuff that were mainly unhealthy and energy dense products, such as sweets, which served as a kind of treat after a long school day or a quick and easy fried dinner. And the exposure to food outlets along the roadside implies a perhaps subconscious encouragement to consume unhealthy food products. On the other hand, the parents who picked up their children uh, from school using cars often tied that school run to a food shop elsewhere in the neighborhood after school, uh, as they are often at a distance from urban centers and require a drive. So the centralization of supermarkets and other shops in large retail parks outside residential areas seems to increase that car-based commuting and linking up that food consumption with the school run. And the buying of energy dense products is often for want of a better, healthier option, which is not easily available in the neighborhood. And what we saw in both New and Brent is that parts of London are what is described as food deserts, places where there is a lack of healthy food options, leading to increased consumption of unhealthy items. And my PhD found us that the structure and the layout of the city plays an important role in determining children's and families' food habits which needs to be addressed together with the biomedical aspects to structurally change and reduce the levels of childhood overweight and obesity seen among children in London boroughs. The dietary patterns and the activity patterns that we observe, as well as the health outcomes, are thus not the result of the individual choice of children or their parents, or their responsibility necessarily. They're often tied up with the environment in which people reside, which needs to be shaped to the benefit of all, not only those struggling with overweight or obesity. Um, and I'm very happy, uh, as Ketan said, uh, said, that we have been working together with, with Brent on this and improving that uh, through the obesity uh, steering group, which has, which has been great. Um, let me stop there. I think that's about five minutes. Uh, happy to take any questions also down the line. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Lander, and thank you for uh, providing that great insight. And I think um, uh, some of the um, issues that uh, you highlighted. Um, of course, we have known about it for a very long time, as I was saying in my opening remarks, but of course, all of that has been rather escalated um, uh, with the pandemic um, uh, impacts. And, and then we will try and um, explore one or two of those uh, in a moment or two. But uh, let me bring uh, our friend Etty Kong um, uh, in now. Uh, she is a senior GP in Westminster and previously she was uh, the chair of Brent Clinical Commissioning Group and responsible for planning and commissioning many of the health services for people living uh, in and around Brent. So Dr. Etty is also a trustee of um, the Ashford Place, a charity which supports the health and well being of homeless people, as well as a founding trustee of Brent Chinese Association. Uh, Etty, really good to have you this uh, evening. And, and I would be very grateful if you could share uh, what's happening um, in your um, uh, surgery. And, and uh, particularly, uh, I know you have been leading a focused piece of work uh, around the um, Afghanistan community um, who have been uh, coming into the country in, in the recent weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have been a GP now for 35 years. So I've seen the change in demographics of our population, the disease profile, as well, uh, as, well uh, as well as leave, uh, lifestyle changes, etc. So eating for health and food as eating for health and food as a medicine is actually a theme that is coming through these days. Over the years, what we have done is we become very dependent on medicines, uh, one tablet for one disease, rather than looking at ourselves, at our lifestyles, and see how we can change in order to improve. So, so a diabetes has been on the increase, childhood obesity, as we mentioned, children's oral health, heart disease, arthritis, all those diseases are related to uh, our lifestyle as well as our food style as well. So it is very important for us to, 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 to now to focus on our wellness based on lifestyle. So it's very important for health professionals not to, to, to look at patients as a patient with, con with disease or conditions, but looking at patients as how we can have a healthier person, uh, age-related with aging, 
but aging in a way that is is in in healthy in a healthy lifestyle. So so what we haven't done well is to promote healthy lifestyle alongside with the traditional conventional medicine of treating patients. So that's that's one thing I have uh, recognized. Again, the other thing about as health professionals, we are very quick at giving advice, but we tend to forget that giving advice is easy. For the recipient of advice to change is difficult. So we have to wait for the right moment of change. Hence, I come to the cycle of change. So, so we need to, to, give, to give advice to patients at the right time in the right, when they're in the right frame. So a lot of times I, uh, I look at myself and I look at my peers, we, we, we say, stop smoking, eat healthily, blah, blah, blah. It's easy to say. So, so time actually is quite a good tool. We have to wait sometimes until the patient is in the right window of contemplation of, of, of the cycle of change. And only then we, we can uh, facilitate change, support change, in order for them to maintain a healthy lifestyle. So, so that's all I want to say about being a, being a clinician, uh, looking after the patients, not to be one dimensional anymore on, on, uh, on, on, on just treating patients uh, uh, with, with the drugs we have or whatever it is. So, so I'm moving on to saying, uh, health professionals should work very closely now with the social prescribers so that social prescribers being our complementary friend who will prescribe non-drugs and when it needs to we prescribe the drugs i should i will stop there thank you very much for that um Etty. uh and one of our friends is just um uh, uh putting uh some words in the chat about education and that uh, takes us very nicely to our friend Danny and um, Etty you talked about breaking this um, the cycle of change uh, and, and and one person who certainly has been breaking that uh, cycle uh, of change is um, Danny uh, so Danny Coyle is the head teacher of uh, Newman Catholic College uh, a secondary school in Halston, which has a strong ethos of serving the common good. When it, when it, uh, when it became clear during the pandemic how many families were uh, facing difficulties buying enough food, uh, then he decided to support families who had got into debt waiting for their first payment of universal credit while others um, were asylum seeking with no recourse to a you know, public fund. And, and this is this is the head teacher of a secondary school who uh, you would not think um, uh, would have the time or, or the energy or the resource to be doing uh, so much of common good. And I'm so grateful that he's been able to find uh, time to join us this evening. So tell us what's been happening uh, in Halston, uh, Denny. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, colleagues, nice to see you all. Good evening. I'm at home now in, in Haringey left Halston a couple of hours ago, so it's great to be here with you. In terms of the question of food equality uh, and equaling health equality, just to anecdote this, this, the beginning of this presentation, of course the two things are linked, but it really came home to me during lockdown, because as we know, the whole experience just shone a light on the pernicious inequality in our society. Um, so by about the end of March, remember lockdown in schools in the UK started on the 20th of March. By the end of March, it was being reported back to me by heads of year and form tutors that parents were telling us that we're going hungry. We're skipping breakfast. We've not enough food for the day. Now, that made me realise, of course, that free school meals and a regular school hot meal, which is pretty healthy, plays a really important part in keeping families healthy and sustained. And when that was taken away during those turbulent, difficult few months of the, lock of the lockdown, before things improved, it really brought it home to us how much people were suffering. Families were going hungry. And that began a whole change in the way we began to operate at the school. 
whilst of course maintaining an academic focus, we began to shift out and focus on delivering food and money to people and more of that later. But essentially, the job of the school is to educate children. And education, of course, has various domains. Schools are actually legally obliged to teach children about healthy eating. I won't quote the national curriculum, key stage one, two, and three, and two, three, and four. You can do it yourself. I've got it here on my phone. But it's quite clear. Schools have to teach about healthy eating and how it works and how children can prepare a healthy meal. We in our school have a healthy school policy, which means no junk food, no fizzy drinks. I can, I've been working in schools in London since the 1980s, and I can remember, you know, certainly at the start of that period, um, having, having, you know, Coke machines and chocolate bars in school, and the children were all over the place, let alone doing ultimate damage to their to the physical well-being. That doesn't happen anymore. You know, we search kids' bags. We search kids' bags. And these days, children understand that if they bring something into school that is unhealthy, it will be confiscated and probably by the teachers. But that's a whole nother different argument. Um, when it comes to food technology, we teach food technology. Children cook every day in our school. We have a nice kitchen. Um, uh, we go our own food. Working with Harsden Mutual Aid Society, we come in every Saturday and the kids grow vegetables and we cook them and they're part of our canteen. So that whole educational process of, of how food works. Of course, we're part of the Right to Food Conference, which is happening at our school on the 12th of March, uh, where hopefully we'll get many of you to come along and talk about how we can best support the local community in educating themselves about healthy eating. But there's also more to it as well. We work very closely with Advice for Renters, a wonderful woman called Pat Fernandez, who comes in and educates our families about how to be wise regarding spending and how you can get the same quality food for the cheaper price if you're smart about how the whole thing works. We have food banks. Now, I don't, I'm not particularly proud of this. You know, we live in the fifth richest country in the world and I've got 30 or 40 families lining up outside school every Friday afternoon collecting food. We're meeting a need in the community. I think we must recognise that sport is a fundamental part of keeping our children healthy. Um, we need to think very carefully about what's happened in places like Harlesden, when there's no community centres anymore, there's no after-school activities. The only things going on are schools and teachers pretty much keeping them open until five and six o'clock. That's not sustainable, really. Um, so what happened to all the youth clubs? What's happened to the organised sports activities that certainly were a key part of my, of my uh, 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 childhood? What about feeding children in the evening? I put in about a dozen bids over the last few years to try to set up a system where children can stay in school till six o'clock and have a healthy meal about six o'clock in the evening. No success with that. I was really interested to hear about, um, about uh, um, Mr. Lander Bosch's discussion of, of the, the investigation into what was going on in Brent. We did something very similar, and I'm probably getting out of my depth now here, Lander, but we did something called the um, C3 Collaborating for Health, where a number of parents and pupils came to Newman on a, on a couple of Saturdays and walked around the area with software doing exactly what you've described. We're trying to raise more money to do it, to do it again. And the identification of, you know, of areas of pollution, of poor housing, of lack of green spaces, of the, of the propensity of, of fast food shops was absolutely astonishing in the Harlesden area. So we do a lot, I think, as a school. I won't mention the summer camp just yet, but I think it's about education. I don't want to sound like Tony Blair here, but we have, we have a responsibility as, as teachers and parents to educate our children about every facet of their development and their upbringing. And eating healthy and being smart about food is a central facet of the teacher's role. I'll finish there, Keitan. I'm just about five minutes. Thank you very much indeed for that, Denny. Uh, so... Uh... Uh, you've talked a great um, deal about um, uh, keeping the um, family healthy and, and doing that in a very sustainable, sustainable way. And, and um, our friend who knows all about uh, that is uh, Salma Meha. Uh, Salma, so good to see you uh, with that beaming smile on your face. Uh, thank you very much and good evening to you. So Salma, uh, many of you will know her, um, is a consultant dietitian with the NHS. She is currently working with the Diabetes Transformation Programme, developing educational resources for ethnic minority populations to improve health, literacy and outcomes. Salma is also a co-author of the best-selling book, World Foods. 
So um, thank you, Salma. And, and it'd be good to understand a little bit more about um, the diet uh, and, and the importance that um, uh, Denny was uh, referencing just a moment ago, Salma. Thank you so much, Kevin, for the wonderful introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here and uh, very humbled for that introduction. If you're happy for me to just share a few slides, because I like showing Please some of the do. images. Is Please. that okay? So I'm going to just quickly run through some slides, um, really just trying to show people some of the work that we've done. Can I just ask, can you all see my slides? Lovely. So um, just to give you a little bit of flavor of my background and what, what I've been doing. Um, so I am uh, very privileged to live and work in Brent. I was born in Brent and uh, way before the pandemic, I have had an invested interest in um, looking at the um, demographics and education of our populations across Northwest London. Um, I cover a very big region, but Brent is one of them. And uh, I've had the privilege of working with many um, voluntary organizations and also social organizations in Brent around the education and prevention awareness of type two diabetes, obesity, particularly in some of the ethnic minority communities. Now there have been their fair challenges when I've been doing this. And we know from the, the COVID pandemic that um, health inequalities has really come out. But way before we started this, we knew that there is limited knowledge and resources out there for our communities. There's also um, limited access to health because of some of the language barriers, the cultural barriers, and also um, people's awareness of uh, the importance of good nutrition and also good health in their, um, their families. So um, further to that, myself and my colleague, Dr. Joan St. John, um, about five years ago, we set aside um, some time and money to do um, very specific tailored work with particular communities, looking at um, what we've looked at is high density food around high carbohydrate intake in particularly the South Asian community where um, my colleague, Dr. Effie Kong mentioned that, you know, we, we don't really focus on nutrition very much. We're very clinical. And I, being a clinician in the last 20 years, there's been a huge shift around medication, insulins, and also new therapies coming out, but very, very little um, investment and time in developing the resources and specifically around um, tailoring the education to cultural needs has really been limited in Brent. But what COVID has taught us that we do need to make sure that this um, we do tailor the information to our communities. But we've been quite privileged in Brent to be working with a lot of the communities locally. So we work very closely with the Iraqi community, with the South Asian, the Somali, um, and also with the um, Afro-Caribbean and the Caribbean communities, looking at the type of foods they have, where they cook, where they shop, where they buy their foods. And we are very fortunate to have this information and share that knowledge with the communities that we work with. So we then went on to developing a resource called the World Food Book, which is one of its kind because it really reflects on the real foods that people eat. So we're not talking about the high street foods. We're not talking about the restaurant foods. We're talking about foods that people uh, resonate with, which they're familiar with, with their daily intake of foods that they would eat is listed in this in this book. But what we have done is we've helped people look at the portions, the values. Um, so whether people are interested in calories or carbohydrates or proteins, we've really simplified this in this book. Um, what we wanted to showcase is that what we eat, um, how we eat and how it impacts our day to day blood glucose impact. Because our, our interest was very much um, showing people how food impacts your diabetes. And that's what this simple resource is doing. Moving on, we really have um, changed the way we um, educate people in how to generate um, sort of visual libraries of foods that people can connect with. So showing them how to cook, how to prepare, and also how to dish out food. So simple images like this can really help people understand how they should portion control and how they should really think about healthier eating. So not necessarily changing the way they eat, but just having a look at how they dish out and how they distribute food. Now, we know we are in this huge race for digital era and trying to get everything onto digital because of COVID or because of the limited resources that we do have in clinic. Um, being a clinician, we know that in a day we can only see a certain number of people, but the race of type 2 diabetes is way faster than what the resources that we have in clinic at the moment. So moving on to the, the smart era of digital diabetes, we are 
creating more and more language specific resources, culturally specific, so people can access this information once they know about it and are taught how to use this uh, digital resources. We really focus very much on connecting people to festivities which are really important to their lives. So for example, Ramadan is around the corner. We're doing a lot of work so that we can engage with people and bring the importance of healthy eating in these sort of festivals. So Diwali, Ramadan, um, whether it's Vesaki, whether it's the Buddhist um, celebrations, we try to connect with people through um, celebrations and festivals which are important to them. Moving on, we've re really tried to change the way we are sharing healthy, healthy advice. So it's not just about healthy eating, it's really about creating and um, bringing the evidence. So whether it's low carbohydrate, whether it's intermittent fasting, whether it's very low calorie diets, the evidence is there, but we need to make sure that the evidence is then trans transformed into culturally specific advice. This work does take a lot of time, but once it's developed, it can be distributed to thousands of people, not just in Northwest London, but across the country as well. So moving on, um, we've done lots of videos. So historically, we would have had videos on very um, generic foods, what people are familiar with. So for, for example, having breakfast, which is you know, to egg and beans, but then we've got to also realize that not everybody would eat these, these foods for breakfast. So we have tried to transform this information into specific foods, creating videos, and also um, voice recording some of these videos into different languages. We know that if these resources are available and shared and distributed with amongst healthcare professionals, they then can be distributed to more families and also individuals living with um, long-term conditions. Childhood obesity, we touched on today, but what we really need to understand is again, when we're talking about childhood obesity, we need to recognize the communities, the culture, the diet within these communities. So recognizing what is available out there, what can be um, provided for these children, and are there suitable resources that we can share with these families to bridge some of these health inequalities? Um, we do do a lot of education around uh, eating or budgets. I'm not gonna talk about that because one of our colleagues today has talked about this. But just to share with you some of the experiences that I've uh, um, been working with some of the schools in um, locally, where we bring in families from dif different ethnic minority communities and together and showcase very simple resources, simple messages and simple ways to teach people the um, importance of change, um, the um, importance of reducing high sugar, high fat foods in children's diets, and also where they can purchase healthier foods and snacks as well. It's not always about um, uh, financial or money or availability. It's sometimes really going back to the basics of giving them that education and bridging some of the barriers in terms of languages and also um, resources as well. Lastly, I just wanted to show that we do share case, uh, showcase a lot of success stories, um, particularly around um, people from the ethnic minority communities, because often we feel that some people don't always come forward because they feel that the, the, the services are not suitable for these communities. But we do want to bridge these health inequalities by showing people that, yes, people from these communities are uptake, uptaking the healthier uh, resources or programs, and they have achieved really, really good uh, success rates. Um, so by sharing some of these stories is really encouraging for other people from these communities as well. I could talk forever about some of the work that we've done here in Brent. But just lastly, showing that how I get people to share the, what they eat, how they eat, um, you know, how cooking can be um, cost effective, how healthy eating can be cost effective. And what we do is we have a really, um, we've got a new Facebook page where in Northwest London, where we're asking people to bring their, their culture foods, share it with us and showcase how they are transforming their diets into healthier practices. So I'm really just going to stop there and take this opportunity to take questions, which I'm, I think we're going to do at the end. So thank you all for listening. I'll stop thank sharing you. and hand over to Kevin. Thank you very much, Salma, for that. Really, I'm grateful. Uh, and talking about showcasing, one person who's been doing plenty of that um, in the um, recent uh, weeks and months uh, uh, during the pandemic is Rajesh Makwana who is the director of Sufra in Northwest London, a community food and support hub that provides emergency aid and holistic range of services to those experiencing poverty, 
homelessness and financial crisis. Rajesh is also a trustee for the Independent Food Aid Network, a UK-wide body that supports around 500 food banks and advocates for an end to food poverty. Rajesh, I know, you know you're, doing, you're doing an amazing work um, uh, here in St. Raffles. It'd be good to um, uh, share that uh, good news story you know, with our friends on the uh, Zoom, please. Thank you so much for the introduction, Councillor Chef, and, and uh, lovely to be here. Really great to hear all the wonderful work that's that's going on from all, all the previous speakers. Um, just to give you a, a bit of background then about Sifra, um, as as uh, as uh, Ketan said, it's it's basically much more than a food bank. We the food bank and the food aid services we provide the food uh, the food bank per se, as well as our community kitchen and, and a range of other services, are gateway services. Uh, for, so that people can access more holistic support designed to address the causes of food poverty and to reduce dependency upon food aid. And that's really increasingly the focus for us because it is just absolutely unsustainable to continue giving people charitable hand, hands out, handouts of, of, of food. Um, so the sort of services we provide include, as I've mentioned, um, a community kitchen where we, we cook food and people eat together in a communal space, in a, in a, in a, in a social space. Um, we have an NHS service where we provide uh, emergency food parcels to patients on, on discharge from hospital if they are likely to go home uh, to empty cupboards. Um, we have uh, an advice service, we have full-time advice workers who provide uh, support to refugees, asylum seekers and to other food bank guests to address housing problems, benefit problems, um, financial, uh, other financial problems, etc. We provide a range of uh, AQA accredited uh, training and employability programs and we, and we operate and, and, and help manage um, a large community garden. Um, where, which is a social therapeutic space and also a growing project where we produce a lot of organic uh, fruits and vegetables as well as eggs. We have many chickens in a, in a chicken coop. Um, so there's a lot going on basically and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's lots of little projects that I haven't mentioned there that, that are happening um, and there are obvious links and, and connections there with the issue of health and health equality. So just to pick up on some of these quickly and then just to talk more, more generally about health um, equality, um, we, the food, food, providing somebody with food, if they can't access that food for whatever reason, is, is clearly going to benefit them in that it will give them access to some reasonably nutritious food. Um, our food parcels, we operate in a very different way now post pandemic than we used to um, before the pandemic, where we pre pack our parcels and we went through during the pandemic doing lots of deliveries. Um, we have had recently, we've had a nutritional report done and we'll be publishing that soon. And um, we're surprised to find actually it's reasonably balanced the food parcels that we provide, apart from the bag of sugar, which we've now made uh, sort of um, uh, on, upon request rather than the standard item in the, in the food in the food parcel. Um, we run a food academy program for young people, which uh, which uh, teaches young people about the provenance of food, uh, how to cook food on on a, on a relatively low budget. Um, we, the community garden that we operate encourages people of all ages to, to come along and grow organic food, uh, which is obviously good for the nu nutritional requirements as also, but for the physical and mental well-being as well, um, being out in the fresh air and, and working together to grow some food. Um, so there's, there's, lots, there's lots going on there that has a direct connection to, uh, to health equality. But I would say from a food bank's perspective, the issue of, um, of food equality equating to health, health equality is a bit of a red herring. Um, providing somebody with all the food that they need is not going to address the structural inequalities that lead to the food insecurity and the health problems that bring them to the food bank in the first place. So really we're just putting a sticking plaster on a much, much bigger problem. And, and, and it's not the solution at all. The real issue is simply poverty, which is caused by uh, many different inequalities and injustice within society. Um, creating uh, health equality means addressing these inequalities and addressing the real drivers of poverty, some of which include a benefit system that is not really fit for purpose. A lot of the people that we support um, are receiving all the benefits that they're due, but they still can't afford to buy the food that they need and pay the rent and the bills, etc. Low wages and precarious jobs, um, sky high extortionate rents that people are paying, paying in the private sector, 
uh, a lack of skills and low educational attainment. The list can go on. There are, there are, there are many um, like sort of proximal causes and more complex systemic causes that lead people um, to the food bank. And, and really to address health equality, we need to be looking much more towards them. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, further than that, I, I would say at the same time that access to food is a human right. And it's a human right that governments um, must be able to safeguard. But, they, but, the, but food as a human right needs to be considered in the broader context of other social and economic rights that accompany the right to food. People need access to housing. They need access to, to decent work. They need access to clothing. They need access to, um, to relevant support in old age or when they're unemployed. They need access to decent healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a complex issue, this. Um, you know, we bring people together and there's something really, uh, you know, just really basic about eating together, about being together in a room, sharing food, growing food together. It really speaks to, you know, our, 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 our inner nature. Um, but doing that is not really the solution. We really need to look at broader, broader ways of addressing the health inequalities that we're talking about today. So just a, just a quick one from me there. Thank you very much indeed. You raise um, a, a very long list of um, uh, very complex issues. And as I said uh, in my opening uh, words that uh, we could never um, do justice within an hour. Uh, but uh, as I said a couple of times that this is just the start of the conversation uh, and, and uh, get us all talking. And uh, I'm so pleased that um, we are talking about this hugely important as well as complex um, uh, subject matter. Uh, now I'm going to pick up, um, we've got uh, about uh, 10 minutes left and I'm going to very quickly pick up um, a few points. Uh, and if I can ask um, uh, uh, our friends to be as brief as possible, so we can take um, a few questions, please, uh, within the 10 minutes um, uh, time that we have left. And let me just go to uh, Etty first. So um, uh, we, we know the high prevalence of um, uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity and um, oral health, uh, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Etty. Uh, but, but how important do you think the role of food play uh, in the wellness, bearing in mind, uh, as um, a few, uh, few of our friends have mentioned in the chat, the inspiring cost of living, and, and which, um, of course, um, uh, uh, our friends have also referenced. It is becoming more obvious that food and healthy lifestyle both are important to our wellness. So, so looking traditionally at uh, uh, our health in the, in the conventional way, we know it's not the best way. So I, I think within the 10 minutes consultation that we have with, with doctors especially, we don't have the time and the forum to discuss that but we should change our role as, uh, as frontline clinicians to be able to start off the top, to start the conversation and then signpost our patients to the right professionals like Salma who got the time to explain to them and uh, families who do not have the financial means to have uh, food, we would say, go to the food bank, or whatever it is. So it's very important now within health, we just don't concentrate on, on, on the traditional way of practicing medicine. We have to change our, our, our methodology. So that's that. Um, so we got to be not only as healers, but as health promoters as well uh, 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 in, in, in our new ways going forward. And we need to be also I think recognize that uh, uh, I would say equality doesn't mean equity. Those two are different things. So equality is giving everybody the same thing, correct? That is equality. But then once you have that, how to reach equity is different. So we need to treat different population, different sectors of our communities differently so that we can get to the end point of equity of care. So I think our language, our approach to healthcare uh, uh, needs to change. 
and think more about health promotion, uh, health prevent, uh, disease prevention and wellness and uh, social, medical, psychological well-being. Thank so you, our concept of, uh, of, of looking at patients when they come to us must change. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Eddie. Well, we've, we've uh, talked about um, Salma's famous book, Here It Is, and I think um, Judith has already um, put a link in the chat. And, uh, and uh, talking about your book, Salma, uh, I I'm keen to understand um, uh, what type of foods should we be eating? Um, uh, particularly, we talked about the um, aspiring cost. Uh, so, uh, on, on a very tight budget, and are there different types of food which benefit us at different ages without compromising on our health, please? Uh, and, and a quick response would be much appreciated. Sure. Um, just to add to, uh, before I go on, um, I don't make any money from the book, no, no royalties at all. It was purely made for um, educational purposes for the NHS. So I'm not um, in any way doing any PR exercise tonight. Um, and that is so why world, I'm flagging the book up the world for that particular book, reason. Um, reflects on I'm very sad to say, say that you we were not able to see the images that I was reflect referring to today um it's very much around having a um meal that is going to meet your complete nutritional needs throughout the you know through your three meals um we're trying to showcase all the essential foods that you do need to have in the right proportion now we know that obesity is on the rise and we're eating the wrong type of foods or maybe too much of certain foods so in a simple answer, we, we are trying to promote people to continue to eat as a family, eat the foods that they are familiar with, but possibly reducing the quantities that they're eating of mostly carbohydrate type foods. So these are, these are foods that we conventionally eat such as potato, rice, bread, pasta, um, foods made out of flour. We know these foods are cheaper we know that people generally tend to eat more of them, and that has an, a, a huge impact on people's weight, their diabetes, their blood pressure, um, and it's very much educating people to reduce their carbohydrate content and increasing the sources of protein. Now, protein is a very good food. Now, people generally refer to protein as meat, but we're educating people to increase their intake of pulses, beans, legumes, um, dals, things like um, also foods like tofu. So much more naturally forming foods. And then we're encouraging people to have more vegetables. So, you know, really trying to encourage people to try to not necessarily have the fresh vegetables from the market or which are more expensive, but even going for foods which are frozen options. Um, but when we're talking about eating on a budget, we do talk about um, batch cooking, we talk about bulk buying, and then what type of foods they can buy, um, which is going to be more cost effective for the whole family. So you, we always encourage people to, to look out for, for things like which are tin foods what as about well, frozen, which are just Salma. as good for you. Salma, sorry to interrupt you. What about, very quickly please, what about... Um, um, uh, breakfast clubs and, sure. uh, and, um, and then he was talking about the evening meals and, and if you could very quickly touch up on that. I'm really I'm glad, glad that did grateful. come up. So we, we know that there are lots of um, free school meal provisions, breakfast clubs, and I'm really pleased to hear that Danny School is doing tremendously well in promoting healthy eating. Um, on the other side, I do see the very much opposite in a lot of schools where they are giving free school meals and free, free breakfast clubs. And I have raised this with the local health authorities that offering fruit juices and offering very much high white bread processed foods to children of our of our communities is not going to benefit them in any way. Um, if anything, it's going to have a detrimental effect on these children's health. Also offering a lot of processed foods such as chips, nuggets, sausages, is still happening in a lot of schools. Um, every school uh, I see, I go to are offering a lot of um, desserts um, at mealtimes. And obviously these, these children um, are going to want to eat these foods, but we need to take a stand and start offering more fresh fruits Thank and you. vegetables, more yogurts, more cheese, rather Thank than the conventional um, which I'm seeing again and again and again when I when I visit schools, it's very much heavily around chips, beans, and sort of friend, um, fish fingers. And I, I generally tend to hear the children don't like vegetables, they only like chips. And so it's really educating um, the, the, the catering and as well as the teachers, as well as the children and doing this as a collective change rather than um, raising any fingers or pinpointing at individual organizations. Thank you. 
Thank you. That uh, takes me nicely to Danny. Danny, why is this so important to you? Uh, and, and, and how does this um, uh, uh, benefit uh, your pupils and generally the, 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 the children and young people's um, educational um, uh, attainment and uh, their physical and mental wellness, please? Okay, just, just to come back on Samuel's point as well, it's a tragedy that so many school kitchens over the years have, be, have been sourced out to private companies who have, a, who have a set menu and regulated portions and food is shipped in the week in advance and stored in the freezer. That's, that's one of the big problems. Fortunately, we've been able to resist that sort of privatisation of our kitchen and the food is cooked freshly every day by a team of people who've been there, who've been there for 30 odd years. I like coming down because it's exciting. I bring my fun way up for the club. We usually come every week. I think someone's agreeing with me there. So I uh, just 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 as an aside, but I think you know you have to be conscious of the fact, Kate Sam, that young people come to school without a breakfast in the belly. The, the chances are they're not going to get fed until half past 12, one o'clock. And I put it past anybody, anybody listening to this presentation to perform productively and learn in no matter what you do, if you haven't been fed. So it's as simple as that. So academic progress is absolutely tied to food nutrition and the healthy eating that children get. We run a, run a, run a, a breakfast club like everybody else does. The food's free for kids if they want to come along from half seven. And the idea is clearly tied. It's not just a question of natural justice. It's also a question of ensuring that the children can perform well and behave well in class. The two things are absolutely, are absolutely linked. Thank you very much for that, Danny. Uh, I, I am uh, moving very swiftly because of the uh, time pressures, uh, so forgive me. Uh, I'm now going to very quickly turn to Rajesh. Rajesh, you, you, you reference um, um, uh, some of the stuff that you are doing uh, so amazingly well. You mentioned the um, kitchen garden um, that, that you have um, uh, at St. Raffles, and I'm just keen to understand how does that play um, uh, um, uh, in enhancing uh, the uh, mental and physical wellness, please? Um, in so many ways, it's actually a social therapeutic space. Um, it's been created largely by volunteers um, in the local community and from outside the very local community, um, even from outside of Brent, we've come along and, 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 and made this a reality. We grow about 70 varieties of organic fruit and vegetables. Um, we've got about 20 chickens uh, that, lay, that, that lay free range eggs. Um, last year, we harvested about 420 uh, kgs of organic produce. Um, interesting, over the pandemic, uh, when we were in lockdown, we had, to, we had to do things differently. And one of the things that we did is we helped uh, local residents, many of whom, because we're, we're based on St. Raphael's estate, which is one of the most disadvantaged communities in, in Brent, the housing estate in Brent. And uh, many people there don't have a garden and they therefore can't grow much. And what we did is we handed out um, hundreds of pounds worth of soil and seeds and we helped um, residents to construct beds that they could they could they could use, and we also used some communal spaces um, and encouraged people to get out there and grow their own food and get involved. Now, obviously, the food itself is nutritious, but you know the physical benefits of getting out, particularly during lockdowns, was was very noticeable, um, and the mental health impact. You know, there's lots of quotes and feedback that we've got. Um, from residents who, who just this was a lifesaver for them just being able to be together outside um, and, and and to and to socialize and to grow food together so there's a lot that we do there's, there's various um, mental health wards uh, from uh, and, and groups and, phys and, and groups with uh, physical health needs who come down and use the space regularly thank you very much for that uh, so friends i started off uh, our um, conversation with lander and i'm going to end with lander and lander in a minute um, uh, or, or less uh, now uh, if you could just uh, very quickly um, uh, uh, just give us insight into how important the food uh, the role of food played in the research paper in uh, health and well-being um, agenda please Thanks, uh, th thanks for that uh, question, uh, Ketan. I think I want to thank everybody else as well for such a comprehensive overview. I think we've touched upon a lot, uh, a lot of uh, topics, and then I want to thank the other panelists for, for providing that, uh, those insights. Um, from my perspective, it's, it's absolutely crucial. Um, you know, the, the food really stood out as not only uh, you know driving health, but also driving 
uh, uh, family connection uh, vital to mental health and well-being, uh, instilling uh, good, good dietary habits. Um, you know, and there is a strong argument to support families in having home-cooked family meals with such a bum, school meals. So all those aspects really uh, uh, came back throughout the research. Uh, if I may just come back and stress something what's been picked up on as well, I see uh, in the chat, um, is that people made those food choices based on what's available to them in their surroundings uh, and in line with their uh, financial resources. Um, you know, so it's, it's, not, it's not an individual's responsibility necessarily, uh, uh, nor a family's responsibility, uh, uh, or, or, or let's say to, to, to have the blame of, of an unhealthy uh, a dietary pattern, if that makes sense. What really stands out is that the environment in which we live, uh, the, the environment to which children uh, in my particular research are exposed uh, in terms of food, that that is what determines uh, their dietary intake. So it's absolutely crucial to take those, uh, all those aspects into conjunction, whether it's at the school, at the home, and most certainly also from my research uh, from the environment. And I think interlinking those aspect uh, as, as we've done today I think during uh, during this uh, during this session uh, is absolutely crucial so thanks thanks for that Kata. Thank you very much so friends I did say that we would not be able to uh, do justice to this very very significant um, area very complex area within one hour but, but but the purpose of this um, uh, hour was to uh, open up the discussion to to set the scene for us to think a bit more about um, uh, uh, what we hear and what we see in the newspaper headlines and hopefully uh, this has been a useful forum to start off that conversation start of that journey to something much more uh, better in, in coming uh, months uh, for all of us, for all of our families, for all of our uh, neighborhoods. So thank you very much indeed. Mm, we'll continue with this conversation uh, in coming months, uh, no doubt, in different forums. But uh, I will hand you back to Judith uh, for a quick um, uh, uh, thanks to our guests who have um, made a huge amount of time to be with us this evening. Judith? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ketan, and thank you to the uh, amazing panel for their insightful, challenging and inspiring contributions. And also thanks to everyone that came. There's been some really insightful comments.